Okay, uh, we still have a majority of students who uh, should be joining, so we will wait for three minutes. Uh, one question. Uh, I got an email from uh, Zheng Zhilai. So, so you get a notification of the class time change, right? Uh, uh, yes, yes. So, so can, can you describe the situation? Because last, last week it also happened that Wednesday students say that there's a class, but we, we never change our class time. So just curious about what, what you see on your side. It's the calendar. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's on calendar, and uh, uh, they appeared. And they have a uh, one hours classes uh, on uh, 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 for Chinese time, but um, three thirty to four thirty almost every day. Well, that's that's weird because I never did any updates in the uh, in calendar or anywhere. So I'm not sure what's triggering that. But well, our class time is still uh, still Tuesday, okay, five to seven thirty p.m. Okay, there's no change. I have uh, sent a uh, ask IT ticket, but I have not got response from them. Okay, so let's see how it goes and what's the reason. But our class time is always the same. We we have no change. I put a, a link to a screenshot that I took just to show you what it looks like. It looks like any any normal class, except it's on Wednesday. Oh, okay. So the time changed to Wednesday, basically, right? Let, let me click it. So, so that's the only time slot, right? So the class time somehow changed to 3.30 to 4.30 on Wednesday, right? instead of a... So is it on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or it's just on Wednesday? In my calendar, it's uh, appeared on, mo on Monday, uh, Wednesday, and, and... Friday, right? Uh, three days. Uh, yeah, and, uh, mine as well. I see. Yeah, that's really weird. I'm not sure what's triggering that, but because we we haven't been making any updates here. Uh, anyway, I sent an Ask IT ticket and they haven't got back to me. So uh, once that's resolved, I will let you guys know. Okay. Can we have extra credit if we attend all three extra classes every week? No, because it's a, it's a <laughs> you know it's a mistake from the system, right? So I don't know why, but we of course. Can. Right, so I think we should at least wait for another 15 to 20 students. I think the majority of the students joined. So yeah, let's wait for one more minute. The tendency is not so good, I saw today, somehow. Usually at this time, we, we have uh, maybe 60 students already. It's a little bit strange. But let's wait for one more minute. Okay, then we should begin. When is our next assignment? Our next assignment is likely today, so we will we will send the next assignment today. Oh, great! It's a written assignment, uh, SVD, and we also have some inequalities that we will teach you today. Okay, so, basically, uh, the next assignment is a written assignment. No, it's by it's today. Yeah, it's, I don't see the attendance uh, improving, so we will probably take attendance. Okay, but but let's first uh, cover what we had last time. Okay. So last time we discussed uh, that uh, in our previous SVD derivations. Right? So we have. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I think we don't need to recap what is SVD. Okay, so I hope you still have the memory. We talked about centering the data right so which means when we, when we find the svd let me see the other chat oh 
Oh, the term project will be released uh, probably next week. Okay. Uh, so so it will be released within two weeks for sure, but probably next week. Okay. So and you should have sufficient time to accomplish them because we we, we will need maybe one week to compile the data and then we can release it. Okay. And uh, so the we will have a description of the project, a very clear description on like uh, existing segmentation models that they can try out. Okay. And we will. We will have the project details released uh, within two weeks, probably just one week. Okay. Right, so uh, let's begin. So, uh, so, so for SVD, uh, in our first slide about the theoretical part, we only talked about how to find the BIs, right? What if you start set out from some points that are not in the origin, right? So we show that if that is the case, the best fitting subspace is really passing through your central. Okay, this is what we proved last time. Okay, this is why we need to uh, center our data. Okay. Uh, I see another student asking about uh, how many remaining projects. We have two written assignments and uh, at most uh, one mini project, uh, depending on the time, what we have it. Okay, if, if we don't have the time, we will cancel that mini, mini project and we will just uh, give the students abundant time to do the final project. Yeah, so that's, uh, but, but when we cancel, basically we give the four, four grades, basically, okay, so no worry on that. And likely we will, we will be able to finish that, but uh, so we at most have one more mini project and a final project. Okay. All right, so uh, we show that uh, really you need to sample your data before you do SVD because of the, you know, V0, right? So uh, if V0 is not, uh, your your VI is starting from V zero, oh, right? Then in that case, your best fitting space passing through this V zero. Okay, that's central. So this is what we see last time, and then we talked about two applications. The first application PCA. PCA is for dimensional reduction, where we we, we have a table right X of n rows and d attributes. We want to uh, map them into a still n rows but k k columns. And we show that this is actually a linear transformation, y equal to xp, where each pi is so-called a, it's like our v, okay, it's a projection, a projection direction, unit vector. They are orthogonal to each other, which means they are 90 degree, 90 degree for each pi and pj, okay. And to show this, last time we, we showed some derivation of, you know, uh, extension of our concept of variance to covariance matrix for a vector variable. Okay, a vector random variable. And then we showed, uh, I will skip all those details because we covered that uh, already, but uh, the conclusion is something like this. Okay. So if you have a random variable, which is X, I will assume this is a vector, by the way. A is a matrix, X is a vector, okay. And when you, A is a constant, X is a real random variable, randomness on X. And you have another A vector, okay, column vector here. Okay. So what if, uh, what's the relation between this variance and this variance, right? So we showed that if you want to uh, move, shift your vector a little bit, right? This constant, it will not impact the variance. So there's no A here, okay? It will be the same. But if you have a constant here, right? When you take it out, if it's a scalar case, it's a A squared, right? But here we should have A variance, A transpose, okay? So this is uh, what we have last time. And then we come back to our derivation. And we said that we will compute first lay the covariance matrix, right? And the covariance matrix is quite similar to here. We say that, uh, you know, each i and a j, right? So i and x i, x j, you, you first center your variable on that dimension, right? Minus the mean value, okay? And time them up, right? So, and uh, after timing them, you take the expectation over all these n rows, right? Because you have n, n rows. Each row take take an attribute value random in some sense. So you look at each row as a random variable. Okay. So here's this x is a random variable of d-dimensional data, right? So, but we want to reduce the dimension to k. And uh, if we, we regard like this, right? So this is really last time we talked about so-called auto product, right? So if you have a row, you have a column, you take the product. It's the result is a matrix. Where your i's row and the j's column is really, you know, xi minus mu i, xj minus mu j, okay, something like this. 
right? So this, and then, then you, after take the product, you, you, you then have the summation and you take the uh, one by n, basically you take the average over all the rows, okay? So that's so-called a sample covariance matrix, right? So it's a representing representation of this covariance matrix why you, you have concrete samples for this variables, n samples, n rows of the data, okay? But, so uh, once you have a data table, the covariance matrix can be computed like this. Any question here? Keep in mind, this mu itself is a vector, okay? It's a, a those, every row you have a vector, right? Then you, you compute the average, gets this vector, this is mu, okay? And that's why you have the outer product. Right, so you have an xi, mu i, okay, and xj, mu j in the outer part. I hope you can see this. So this result will be d by d. Okay, so keep in mind the covariance matrix always d by d, right? Because it's it's saying, hey, you have d-dimensional attributes, right? X1 all the way to xd. It's describing the so ij's element is describing how xi and xj are correlated. How they are related. If they are independent, then it should be there. Okay. And uh, so this is a kind of d by d matrix. Right? So the, this is x1 to xd, this is i, and this is j. Okay. It's really how the columns are related. Okay. But if you compute the uh, two columns, you look at all their values in the rows and how they are related. Okay. This is how you compute. Uh, like a co co correlation is an uh, you know, extension of the covariance. Right? So you can also compute correlation. If you do the Pearson correlation, normalize basically the, the variance. Well, here we, we don't have that. Okay. Here we, we are computing the covariance, not the correlation. Now, you think about it. Uh, this x is x1, x2, these are rows of your, your data, right? And as on each row, you want to map to a direction which is P1, a union vector. So what will happen is basically that say this row is actually this space. Yeah. If you map to P1, you basically uh, you map to here, okay? And this is like this times cosine theta here, right? So this thing times cosine theta here, this is actually equivalent to inner product. Then you have the component along this P1 direction, okay? So you're doing this. You are, you are computing after projecting all the data points along P1. You have their projected values, right? So the project coordinates starting from origin. These are the project coordinates, okay? Right. For each i equal to one, then it's p1 in the product is p1. If it's uh, n equal to two, the i2, right, the second data point, right, then it's p1, second data point, okay? There's another rule that if you have a bunch of data points and the mean value is here, if you project to, uh, uh, to let's say this is two dimensional space, if you project to one dimensional space, Okay, right. so this this will still be the main along this along this dimension. Okay. If you, your data is the main, if you project to a lower dimensional space, this mean is still that it's still your mean. Okay, so we say that if you have a high dimensional mu right, d dimensional mu after projection along p one, after projection this high dimensional point will be sit in the middle of all the projected values of your rows. I hope this is fine. Because this is how you define mu, right? Along each coordinate. X1, X2, X3, right? divide by three, so you know, have three points, okay? The second, Y1, Y2, Y3, divide by three. Right? So along every dimension, you take the average. Then you are really in the middle. Uh, even you project to a different dimension, okay? So now that this becomes a coordinate of Xn, that's the n state point, along P1. This is the coordinate of the mean point along P1, right? So then you can see this is really the variance, okay? Right? So your, your coordinate minus the mean coordinate along this direction, okay? It's the variance of your coordinates along this direction, okay? Because this is a square, but you, you take the summation and it takes the one by n. So it's similar to here, okay? And uh, you think about it, if you have a lot of data points, right after you map to here, what do you want? You want to maximize the variance or minimize the variance? Who can tell me? Maximum. Yeah, maximize the variance. Right? Because you know you want them to be differentiated as much as possible. Right? It keeps keeps still. If your, your original data points, they are very different. 
Okay. After mapping here, you flip this perpendicular distances here. Okay. But th these components do do that. So so you can still separate them properly. Okay. Uh, this is a, a, a extreme example. If you look at a, a bunch of data points. So you can intuitively see that, uh, let's change the name. This direction is good, right? Because if you map to here, you map to here, the perpendicular distance is small, but the coordinates are very separate, okay? Along this direction, okay? A, a bad direction would be something like, uh, let me give you another example. A, a bad direction would be this direction, right? But everyone is uh, basically mapping to the same range, okay? The variance, after mapping will be around the same range. Okay? Everyone will basically map. Uh, should be. Everyone, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, does any standard like how much variant you have to like reserve from PCA? So there's no standard, basically it's optimization. You want to find a, a direction, P1, that maximize your variance. Okay, so when you were uh, doing PCA, you want to like give, for example, the algorithm and uh, number to like extract the features. And for example, like you do 100 or 200, they will give you the total variance differently, but they are not like that much. One is maybe 90% and the other one is 95. And mm -hmm. is it always better that you choose the greater um, uh, preserve variance? Uh, it's actually this, the variance is derivation of the PCA. After the PCA, the, this P1 will be similar to SVD's V1. It's actually the same, it's okay. Then after this dimension is gone, you will choose a V2, right, which is P2. We are talking about uh, a particular dimension right now. It's okay? Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, we are just uh, deriving the same as SVD. Basically right now, you want to choose a union vector, right? Union vector P1 to map all your data. But the first dimension, you should make the variance as large as possible. Don't make it small. So this will not be a good direction. This will be a good direction, but we want to find the best direction when you rotate, uh, you know, all possible uh, up uh, P1 are uh, all possible directions, right? All, all angles. Uh, is, is this clear to you? Yeah, yeah. If it's just unique direction, that's fine. Yeah, it's a first dimension. Okay. The second dimension will be similar. It's perpendicular to the previous dimension. You don't want the same. Uh, components, right? so you want to all put together. Right. So here, because this definition is a variance along P1, okay? right. so we can write it like this. Well, now this X is a random variable, right? So the in, in materialization, instantiation of those random are the rows in the X matrix. Okay? Well, you can always compute a covariance matrix based on reasons. Right. So now that's the interesting part. Okay. Now we know that if you look at the target you want to maximize, right, which are the, the coordinates along P1, okay? This, this variance can be written like this, okay? But our random variable, which means a row in your data is X. This P is a constant once you, are pick, you pick that direction, okay? And how, how can we take all of this constant, right? Because our randomness is along X, right? Each row, how you sample from the background data set. So let's look at uh, our previous slide. Okay. So basically we are using this conclusion. But if you take your, 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 uh, your matrix out, this matrix can be extreme cases, uh, you know, a column vector. Right? So how many rows, n by k, right? but this k can be one. Okay. So if you think about this, right? when you take a out of it, so here left-hand side is a, uh, right-hand side is a transpose. Okay. So now we come here. So what will be what will be the result when you take P1 out, P1 transpose out? Right hand will be P1 transpose. Okay. Right hand will be P1 transpose transpose. Okay. Transpose. transpose. So if you transpose something twice, you, you get it back. Okay. So that's why you have P1 transpose C P1 because C is a variance of S. Okay. So here, basically, you, you should be able to see what is that. so. This C is really your variance or your data rows. Okay? That's why when you get a data row, you first compute it. Any question here? All 
All right, so if you have not, let's summarize what we have so far. So we, we, we want to find a P1, a unit vector, such that, you know, because we have the data X, right now we treat it as a random variable, but the randomness actually is the data we have at hand. Right? So we can compute it to sample variance. Okay, and so we have this C here when we have the data. But P1 now becomes the, the, the direction we really want to choose. Okay. We want to pick a P1 that can make the variance the largest. Right? So we are maximizing. We find a, so, so let's go to the next page. So we are, we are trying to solve this problem. Right? So we want to find a particular unit vector direction P1 such that the variance, right? So this thing is the variance, okay? is maximized. Okay, we want to maximize this, right? But this is a constraint optimizing problem because you know we have a constraint that P1 is a unit vector, okay? So which means P1 is in a product which means P1 is vector length, okay? This thing is equivalent to this P1 vector length square. Right? And it's one, so square or not square the same, okay? So, so basically we, we wanna make sure this thing is less than equal to one, okay? And we can, we can write it, you know, using Lagrange multiply, okay? And then make sure the other side is zero. So we can move this up there, not inside the thing, then you got this two. So by using Lagrange multiplier, uh, you will get an optimization problem where you want to find a P1, and maybe you can also have a lambda, right? So then, then you can maximize this one, okay? So that's where uh, we, we kind of, we are using our previous conclusion. I'm not sure whether you still remember. I, ho I hope you remember, okay? So let me, let me see whether we can, can go to the previous slide. Just Uh, so this, uh, so we have a slide on how to take derivative, if you still remember. This is maybe just used here once uh, in the data science course, okay, but it's super important and uh, it's actually, let, let me just get it here. It's actually used extensively if you do machine learning, okay? so you do need to know them. Here, if you look at the preliminaries, I can actually play it first because we can flip. So the first conclusion you need to remember is this conclusion, okay? If you have a variable, you take the to that variable, which is a vector, right? And when you have the inner product, with a vector, right? so A transpose A. See, this is like AX, take the to X is A, okay? Right? In the scalar case. So your, your result A. So here you have a transpose, but take here, you don't have a transpose. Okay. Keep this C9, which is super important in our duration. So come here, if you look at, uh, oh, actually this one is not right used here. We, we are using the other one, the other conclusion. Okay. This conclusion here, right? <laughs> this is like AX square, right? And if you take it over to X, it's two AX, okay? But here, because, you know, it's not a scalar, it, the matrix is not just, if it's not symmetric, we need to write it like this. If it's symmetric, we can simplify as A2, AW, okay? So then it's, it's kind of equivalent. So we are using this conclusion basically. So if you come, come back here, so now we need to take derivative of this thing. Let's denote this whole thing as F, okay? Take derivative P1, okay? And it's up to zero. Then the P is the best P. So what will be the result, right? So if you look at this, remember this is a covariance matrix, i, j, j, i, their covariance will be the same, okay? So this is two AX, right? That's two C, P1. I hope you can see that, right? So this is uh, using this one. Right? This is P, this is C, this is okay? P, C, this is P1. Then, then we take a derivative to the second part because uh, the rule still holds for derivative plus is like uh, take each term to and you know, this is a constant around to P that you are taking the, you can ignore this, you have this. But so uh, again, so this should be minus, right? Because the coefficient here is minus. Right? And how to, how to take the to this thing, okay? So there are several ways you can see it. Okay, the easiest way is you, you treat it like transpose has your identity matrix, right? That's transpose, okay? If you do this, 
then you, you, you will see basically it's the same strip as this, but I is identity. Right? So it's like a two C become two I P one. Okay. So identity matrix times your column vector is just a P one set. Okay. So we can we can erase this, and then we set this into equal to zero. Right. So in other words, if we set this equal to zero, right? in other words, we are saying, hey, these two should be equal. Okay. And we can we can cancel the two. This is why you get CP1 equal to line up here. Is this is okay. Again, you can do element wise computation, but if you memorize these two, these two formulas for quadratic and linear, it will help you a lot, a lot in your derivation. Okay, this is really helpful, especially when you read uh, machine learning literature. This, this is super helpful. Okay, because for example, uh, so we are talking about simple. Uh, the uh, formula. So if you look at a Gaussian, right? Gaussian means high dimension. Okay. Let's say this high dimensional Gaussian distribution, but itself is, uh, you know, it's kind of like a quadratic form. If you look at uh, this shape, it's very similar to quadratic form. Okay. If, you have the coefficient in the middle and you, it's, it's like AX squared, right? Originally you have the uh, sigma X minus mu squared, okay? Yeah. But now if you have multivariate, this becomes the inverse of the, the covariance matrix we talked about earlier. Right? And this becomes a quadratic form, right? Because it's a quadratic form then you can decrease. Right? So, so you need to know these things uh, we covered in order to go to high dimensional uh, analysis. But here in this course, we, we have minimal, right? So even in machine learning course, we only require you to remember this formula and this formula, okay? We will not go to advanced ones. But advanced ones, you can actually derive them yourself. For example, if you look at matrix, book, book. But, uh, let's just get some. So this is a very famous book if you are doing machine learning. Usually, this is a true pool book. Okay, so you will, for example, if you are doing great descent, you want to take derivative, right? So come here. You, you have eigenvalue, you have inverse, etc. Right? So, so, for example, here, you see this is a vector lens, right? It's called a null. So you will go to somewhere vector null. Okay. And if you come here, you see this thing, but right? this thing is 2x. Two, two you immediately get the conclusion, right? So previously, we are deriving this, but we know that this thing itself, when you take derivative, this is p1, right? Norm square. Then you can you can come here, right? So Q1 norm square, take Q1 is Q. Okay. So you, you can derive this without looking at an identity in the middle. Right? Another method you can see this is uh, following our definition. But right? if you follow our definition here, uh, like uh, this de this definition, okay. Just to follow this definition, you will see it. For example, if you, you remember, uh, we have the we are talking about the Q1 square. Let's say the P1 vector is something like uh, uh, X1, blah, 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 to XD, okay? So what will be P1 transpose times P1? Right? It's an inner product of P1 with P1 sum. This will be the, the final value, the function will be X1 square plus X2 square, all the way plus XD square, okay? Now let's, I, I actually should write this as G. Right, and since it will be clear, because here on this slide is ready in G. Okay, now let's follow the definition of the word circle gradient. Right, just follow the definition, you will get the same thing. Okay, because you know G to x one square, this first term will be two x one. Okay, and two x two to blah blah to here is two x one. Right, so if you take out the two, it become two a column vector of x one. Blah blah blah. XD. Usually when we write a, a vector, it's column vector. So we, we want to save space, we will write a row vector. We don't use multiple lines, but we transpose it means a column. So you can see this is two, two P1, okay? So if you follow the definition, you also get the same thing. Right? But again, so these are just the, you know, you don't want to follow definition for everything, right? This will be really slow. That's why you memorize so many formula for derivative in your calculus. But this is uh, now we are going from here to here. Okay. Again, just keep in mind you 
just uh, need to remember linear form and the quadratic form. That's good enough. Okay, in, in most cases. And uh, if you really need to go to the, uh, the matrix cookbook for more advanced stuff. Right? Okay, so that's that's what we derive here. So here, what we get is this, right? So we want to find a unit vector to maximize the variance. Okay, so this is the best direction Q1. Right? Okay, so now we, our conclusion is that, hey, P1 should uh, satisfy this rule, which means given your covariance matrix, okay? This C, you, you know, it's a uh, first lattice covariance matrix first let C, okay? Right. So given your covariance matrix, right? And this P means projection vector. Right? So this P is projection. Okay, lambda is usually for what? Lambda is for, you know, first eigenvalue. Okay, so this is really eigen decomposition, right? If you remember you have a matrix A, and you want to find an eigenvector x such that it's equal to lambda x, right? Which means after linear transformation on x, it's another vector that along the same direction. This is true, right? After a p1, still you get a direction along q. So that means p1 is an eigenvector of c, and lambda one is an eigenvalue of c. Okay, I hope you can see that. Any question here? And this C is a covariance matrix. You can either compute from the data matrix X. So that's a theoretical foundation for why, you know, PCA is really simple. PCA is firstly, get your eigen, you know, get, get your covariance matrix from X, like compute your covariance matrix. After that, do a PCA over the C, uh, do, do a eigen decomposition over C. Okay, so then it's your uh, PCA. I can even, you got P1 is a, P1 is actually the first eigen vector. P2 is the second eigen vector, okay? So here uh, in the machine learning course, we will, we will also go to P2, P3, right? So more derivations, but actually it's not difficult to see that. We will, in, in this course, we really want to keep it simple. Right? We are not having so many multivariate calculus, okay? So yeah, anyway, so the takeaway message is this, right? So why, why lambda one, right, is a first eigenvalue? Okay, because we know that eigenvalues are ordered like this. Right? Lambda one is the largest, lambda two is a, a little bit smaller all the way here, and this is at least a zero. Okay, some small value can be dropped. Okay, this is because for symmetric real matrices, your eigen decomposition to the eigen matrix is always going to be non negative. Okay? We have that uh, property to, uh, to guarantee. So why is this? This is the highest positive value. Here. Right, so the answer is very simple. So you, you think about uh, what we are doing. We want to maximize this. Right? This is the variance, okay? We want to maximize the variance. Right? Now we know that CP1 is what? CP1 is lambda 1 P1, right? So if we, 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 we write this variance, right? We can say P1 transpose times CP1, okay? This is CP1 is equal to lambda 1 P1, okay? Now we have the P1 in a product with P1, because this is a scalar you can take out. Right? But this is a union vector, so they're in a product with one, okay? So you get lambda one. So this is what we have. We say that the variance itself is actually the lambda one, okay? Or, or your, a particular eigenvalue. Okay? But we know that we want to maximize this, right? So of course we will take the largest eigenvalue. Right? So this is how you prove this. And uh, the second dimension is you're taking the second largest, right? third largest. Right? We can show easily that, you know, uh, but there will be another term here. But we, we will ignore those details here. We don't want to make it too, too difficult. But you can get the, the intuition. Okay. But overall, this is what I want to convey to you. Okay. If you get an X matrix, uh, you can compute the SVD. Uh, another option is you compute if they are covariance matrix, right? and then you do a uh, eigen decomposition. They are the same thing. Okay. Eigen decomposition has to work with a uh, square matrix, right? symmetric square matrix. And after the covariance matrix, right? it will be a square matrix, a uh, positive semi-definite matrix. Okay? And that's why the eigenvalues are always going to be non-negative. And uh, again, there's a lot of other duration details. Uh, we, next semester, uh, I mean, the fourth semester, we'll have a machine learning course. We'll cover those things in more detail. Here, we'll just to give you an idea. SVD on the original X matrix, or you first compute the covariance matrix and then do, do eigen decomposition. It's the same thing. Okay, it's PCA.
So now, what's the relationship between PCA and SVD? I just described the difference, right? But let's let's look at in in more detail, right? So we know that any original data matrix, right, you can decompose into SVD. Okay. Here, because we are considering a covariance matrix with D by D, right, we actually rotate rotate this X matrix. Okay. So which means here we are regarding this X matrix as you know the first column is the first data row. Okay. The second column is data. The third is your, you know, the third row, which you already rotated, transport. So that's why it's a D column, okay, by N rows, right? But here we rotated them, okay? This is helpful in our later notations. Just keep in mind here, we already rotated this. And the rotated matrix is still a matrix, right? So we, for any matrix, it can always be SVD like this, right? And then let's take a look at uh, what will be the result of X times X transport. So firstly, why do we why do we care about x times x transport? The answer is very simple because n, let's say you have n data rows, one divided by n times this thing. Okay, that's your covariance matrix C. Okay, so this will, but how do you see that? Right? So let's let's take a look at how, how we can see that. Okay? Just think about it. Right? So x1. Is columns, right? So this is like say the first data row of let me see. this is your first data row. It's one now become a column vector, the second right? and the, the, the nth data row. Okay. So if this is if you run it as a block matrix where you each column vector is this. Okay. And then you times the transpose. You think about this transpose is really something like this. Right? So you have the X1, because X1 we say it's a column, so you transpose it, becomes the first row, okay, blah, 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 and Xn becomes a row, okay. Now, because of the, the column, a uh, block matrix notation, you know that if your dimension matches, then you can you can treat them as a, you know, a, a regular matrix. Right? So this is what? This is a column vector, right? This is a, a D-dimensional, right? so this is D by one. And you, you look at anything here, let's say this one, this is what? This is n by d, okay, because it transpose. Yeah, so this dimension matches, so you, it, it works in block matrix notation. Right? And then you come back and look at again, you can see that this is like an inner pearl. Right? So you have these things, and these things, it's looking pretty much like an inner pearl. Right? So you know that the inner product of this will become something like summation over i, okay, equal to one to n. Then you have this term times this term, like this, okay? The second term times the second term, and the nth term times the nth term, okay? So what you have is xi times, uh, let's get rid of the times, okay? Keep in mind this is a column, okay? Times xi transpose. And keep in mind, uh, this thing is a column vector, this thing a row vector, uh, and this, uh, what, it, you know, this is not inner part, this is outer part. If a column times a row, give it a matrix. So basically you have N matrices, right? So this becomes a matrix shape. So this is our product. So now N matrices are summed together. Okay. So this is uh, what you can see. But but now what's important, let's look at what is in each element. Okay. So think about this is the ice data row. Okay, this is ice data row, right? And the ice data row have D attributes. Okay, the D attributes. So this is the D by D, by D matrix, okay? Right. And this is a particular IJ's item here is, is your, your, you know, assume the data is centered. This will make our analysis so simple, get rid of them, okay? This is really, you know, the, the XI, the XI times XJ. Again, we, we should not use the same I, okay? It's a different notation. Now we are, we are focused on a particular data item, the, the ice row of the data, right? Then the element is really there are two attribute values come together. Okay, this is a scale attribute values. This is the value. Okay. Right. So, so you can see, uh, then we, we sum them n times, right? So, so here you can see something like, uh, uh, yeah, we should play this, okay? So you can see this is the, this E average is something acting like, uh, sorry, this E is acting like uh, one by N and summation of I equal to one to N, okay? Right. 
And here for each term, you have i and j. Right? So for each element. So, so each time, each term is a matrix, then you sum those matrix up. Right? So this gives you x times x transpose, what we see before. Assuming the x is already rotated to b by n. Okay? So this is how we got this. And if we further divide by n, then we get the average, which is what this. I hope you can uh, don't get too confused and you can rewatch the video, then you will get it. Okay, so usually if you see that uh, many, many times, you will notice, I say. So again, keep in mind this is rotated, okay? Which means if you originally have a data matrix X, so if your original data matrix X here, okay? So your, your, your variance, the covariance matrix C is really equal to what? Who can tell me? According to what, what we analyzed before. It's equal to one by n, right? Times x transpose times. Okay. X transpose times. I hope you can see that. Right. Because here we rotate it. Now it's they become x, x transpose. Without rotating, if this is a real data matrix, x transpose times x divided by n is a covariance. If that's how simple you can go from X to a C and then do an eigen decomposition on C, you get your, uh, you know, you get your dimensions. Eigen, first eigenvector, second eigenvector, third eigenvector. Okay, these are the dimensions that you, you need to map for dimensional reduction. Okay, any questions so far? I hope this is not getting crazily complicated. Okay, so, so this is a, uh, X, right, we put it here. And then you have the X transpose. I right? copy this here, but transpose. When you do transpose, you will go this direction. Okay, you first look at VTT, okay, which is BV, and then the, the diagonal matrix, right, this singular value diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix transpose it or not, it's the same. Okay, then you have the U transpose, right, then you can use. Okay, so you will get this thing. And this thing we can actually simplify and this, right? So this is because U transpose times, uh, V transpose times V is an uh, identity matrix, right? So just think about, uh, let, let's get just uh, do this, right? So remember we have maybe, this is V1, okay? This is V2. Right? Maybe we can write it, V1 transpose, V2 transpose, okay? V3 transpose, which is a V transpose, okay? V3 transpose. Assuming we only have three uh, Vs, thank you. Then the, the transpose of V is something like this, right? So you have, this is uh, V1, V2, V3, okay? Then we are again using block matrix notation, right? So, so this thing is super useful, okay? Uh, so we have a column vector kind of thing times a row vector kind of thing, okay? Yeah, so, uh, so this gives you a matrix, right? If you remember, right? Okay, this gives you a matrix. Actually, we don't even need the block matrix thing to see that, right? So this is a, you know, this element is what? This is the first row times the first column. Right? So it's a union vector, so this is one, okay? This is one. Similarly, the secondary row times second column, third row times the column. But anything like here, this is zero because, you know, this is the first row times the second column, which is V1 in a form V2 because all these dimensions are orthogonal. You know, we choose that, okay? Right? So, so this V are orthogonal. So these are orthogonal in the product zero, okay, so you can see. Okay, so any matrix like this, they can cancel. Okay, no matter what's U or V, whether it's this transpose that, because your matrix transpose is your, in, it's kind of like your inverse, right? It's not a strictly inverse because, you know, this is not a square matrix. Okay? Maybe you have 10 dimensions, but only three rows. But again, the, the kind of inverse rule still holds, which means, you know, VT has V equal to V has VT. As the energy matrix. Okay. But again, so the energy matrix so dimension could be different. Right? This could be three by three, this could be 10 by 10. Okay. But you still have some, some similar rule. Like this. But again, you don't have the concept of V transport, uh, V inverse, right? because this could be a, a non square matrix. Okay. This could be a rectangular shape, not, not square. Okay. But again, we know these two can cancel into another matrix. Then what left is uh, how you time this to turn. Right? And uh, keep in mind, so if you have a diagonal matrix, something like this, right? this is maybe A1, A2, A3, okay, A3. Okay. And you have another diagonal matrix, B1, B2, B3, okay? 
what will be the, the, the product of that? Who can tell me? What for still remember? All right, so your diagonal matrix time together, you can just time the diagonal together. So this will be A1, B1, okay? A2, B2, uh, A3, B3. Why? It's very simple to see, right? So if you time this row times six column, the zero term is gone, right? A1, B1, it's pretty clear, okay? A2, B2 is the same, okay? A2, B2, and the diagonal, okay? But if the time to uh, two row and a column that are not matching, right? so for example, if you time the first row, on the second column, then you know the first term here is A1, but here this is zero, okay? The second term, now it's Z, you are zero, then this becomes B2. Right? So the, you take the inner product, it's always there. Okay. I hope you can see that. Right. So, so now, you know, diagonal matrix multiplication is just uh, every atom squared on the diagonal, right? because it's the same atom. So, okay. so we can simply write this kind of diagonal, diagonal matrix as sigma squared. But it's just a every element square. Okay, any question here? Again, once things go to high dimensional and uh, you have to use a matrix, but and this just to get a little bit uh, crazy. Okay, so uh, that's why, you know, in computer science, we, we have two basic courses. One is called the calculus, right? so you, you know how to take it The second is linear algebra. Right? So, you, you need to be comfortable with matrix notations when you go to high dimensions. Okay. And uh, knowing them and not knowing them is like, uh, you know, uh, 3D animals looking at the 2D animals. Right? So, it's, so, so you, sometimes you need to promote yourself from a different perspective. You cannot always think about the matrix multiplication. It's this row times this column, this value. Right? So if you always stick to that, you cannot see through more advanced stuff. And you need to memorize some of the computer. So then you can do it quickly. Okay. All right. So, but again, so because this course is not about uh, linear algebra, so we will just cover whatever we need and uh, let you convince yourself. Right? So for more advanced stuff, uh, it's out of scope of this course. Okay. But in case you don't have background, we will cover everything that you need to know to catch up with. Yourself. Maybe in a more advanced course, they will not even describe those things. So, uh, yeah, so using SVD to perform PCA is actually bad, uh, better okay, because if, if, you know, if you compute a covariance matrix right, and then do agony composition, it's actually numerically not so stable. It's better just to do your SVD on the original X matrix, right, directly do that. Then your V1, V2, V3 are the same. But right? how to see that? You can see this U, right? So this this is a this U. Basically, it's not V, it's U because we rotated, right? This is a D by N. So this our V one V two V three now becomes V one V two V three. Okay? This V one V two V three are really P one P two three, right? Because if you come back to um, let me see where down here. Okay? So this this becomes the the, the eigen decomposition. Okay, this is our SVD. So I'm going to call in this P, D, P, P transport, right? If you remember these things. Now, if you look at uh, what we derived here, right, this becomes U, right? P becomes U, D becomes this, there's a epsilon square, so, uh, sigma square, okay? And then this use U transport. Okay, this is the eigen decomposition over this, this matrix, okay? This N times the covariance matrix, basically. okay? And it will give you this thing, right? So we are saying that after doing this uh, eigen decomposition on this, right, this eigen, okay, you will get this eigen vector. Okay? They are equivalent to your SVD, the V vectors. Okay? After rotating, of course, it becomes U. Okay? So they, really, they are the same. Okay? So, so the ultimate conclusion is saying that if you get a data matrix X, you can firstly compute your covariance matrix. Right? So, Let's transpose this and divide by n. This is your covariance matrix, which you will see. Okay, and then you can do SVD. Uh, you can do eigen decomposition over this matrix. Okay. So this is solution one. Solution two directly do SVD on X. So actually, directly do SVD on X is numerically more stable. Okay, and how to do SVD we already described. If you remember the power iteration method, right? 
So it's very stable numerically as long as you do more iterations, the first eigenvector will come up. And then you can cancel that and then come to the second eigenvector. Okay. All right, any question here? Again, we will keep our assignment uh, simple. So as long as you know some like uh, key conclusions, like those things, you will, you will be able to do some evaluation of those, uh, those things. Okay. We will not make it super difficult. I know there's a lot of linear algebra stuff here. Okay. All right, so, so next let's take a look at uh, what if, so, so in, the, in, in the normal case, right? so you have, uh, you have maybe you are you are checking do a machine learning model on car price. Right? So you have few attributes, okay? Right? You have not many attributes. Right? Maybe car uh, car model, right? The, the, the color of the car and how many miles have been uh, uh, driven, right? So and then you have the different cars, okay? And then you want to predict their their price, okay? Like secondhand car, okay? What's the price? Of it? Right? So this is your input. This is the price you want to predict. Okay. So this is a normal case, right? You have uh, lots of cars, a lot of samples, and it's big. But the columns is small, okay? The columns are really small. Right? So you don't have much attributes. This is the same as if you have a, uh, like a mortgage, right? So if you, you know, in bank, you have N customers with a salary savings, etc. not many attributes, okay? And then you have uh, many, many customers. Then you can try a machine learning model. If you have a new customer, whether I should, uh, approve the market or not. So this is a normal case, but there are peculiar cases that are not normal. For example, in the medical research, we probably can only collect 100 people. That's a lot already, okay, they are medical data. But their medical data can have lots and lots of, like a, you know, heart rate, and today, tomorrow, and then maybe some other like a blood pressure and some, like a, whether to take a, some drug, right? So lots and lots of things. So this will cause the, the table to be flat, which means you don't have any samples, right? But your attributes are skewed. Right? So this is a, the other case where D is huge, but number of rows is small, okay? So when this thing happens, right? So if you do the original, uh, you know, S SVD, it's gonna be very inefficient, okay? So for example, if you do a PCA, right? Of course, you know, if you do PCA on a smaller matrix, it will be, you will be happy, right? You think about it. So we are talking about it's already rotated. So X is D by N, okay? So if you, uh, if you, you still insist on your SVD, uh, your agony composition here, right? Your agony composition here, that will be created because agony composition on a, uh, this is a D by D matrix, okay? Because it's D by N and N by D, right? So it's D by D matrix. But we know that D is huge, right? Maybe N is a hundred, but D is 10,000, okay? Then it's unacceptable. So naturally you will think about, a, you know, compute the other way around, right? So this is a D by N. So then if you first do transpose, right? if you do transpose, this thing becomes N by D, okay? And this thing becomes D by N, okay? Then this becomes a matrix to N by N, right? Again, don't think about in a regular manner where you have 10,000 customers, right? not many attributes. Right? So 10,000 by 10,000 is good. You think about, let's say, medical field. You only have 100 patients for a particular disease, right? so, or for rare disease, okay? Uh, not many data samples, but you have a lot of readings. Right? So, so really, uh, n by n becomes smaller. It's 100 by 100, which is a smaller matrix that you do PC, which is better than you do 10,000 by 10,000 along the dimensions, okay? So that's it the intuition we, we, are, we are talking about. So if you have very high dimensional, not many N, then you can do the other way around to do this, okay? Utilizing the SVD's property. Let's see how we can do that. So now we are doing PC on this thing here, right? But our ultimate goal is not to do PC on this, right? So we know that our covariance matrix is really decided by this thing, right? We still want this thing, but this thing is too big. Okay, this is uh, D by D, D is now Q. Okay. So we first want to do something like do an N by N matrix PCA, right? But hopefully after doing the PCA, okay, these dimensions and these, uh, uh, you know, eigenvalues can be reduced to compute 
you know, the other way around, right? We can, we can compute a really X, X transpose GCA results, okay? But without uh, having to do a huge matrix GCA, right? So this is our goal. And let's see how we can achieve this goal. And after this, uh, this slide, I, I think we can take a break. And then we will, we will come back and we will take a 10. All right, so now X assumed to be centered. We, we just, just get rid of the you know, mean notation. Okay, it's already centered. Now we know that, so, so this is similar derivation as here, okay? So you remember here we say X, X transpose will get this, right? We can cancel something in the middle and just thing square. If you do the other way around, I think we can skip this, right? So we will get V on the other side and the D, uh, the, 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 the diagonal square. Okay, so I hope you can, you can see this. It's, it's the same derivation basically. It's this time U in the middle, okay? And then we know that the covariance matrix of what is, is this thing, right? We, we told you it's one by N times this, thing, right? So now let's, let's see how can we use SVD's property to go from PC on this to the result of PC on the covariance matrix here, okay? which is huge, which is, uh, uh, D by D. So let's first look at uh, this term, right? So this is, this is the covariance matrix. This is C we really want. And this is the eigenvector V1 we really want, okay? And we know we don't have V1 because if we do the PCA, uh, we, we, we don't really need the VI, okay? What we need is UI, okay? We need a UI. We want this UI. These are the P. So how can we go from VI to UI? I think you should already uh, kind of me uh, memorize, right? So VI, UI, there's a way to go over that. And so, okay, let, let's think about this. Okay. Firstly, uh, so let's take a look at uh, what is XVI, right? So we know that by single value decomposition, XVI is your DI, UI. DI is a single value. Okay, so if you still remember that property, uh, let me just go there so that you can memorize this property. These are will be used in your sum, okay? We are, we are using these properties. Now A is X, okay? Let's go back to there. Right, so next, we know that DI is a constant, right? You can move forward. So then we get A transpose times UI. A transpose times UI is uh, DIVI, okay? Yeah. And then you have another DI, so it becomes DI squared. Yeah. I hope this is clear as a step. Any questions so far? Okay, so next what you can do is, you know, we can left multiply in another X, right? So, you know, this term is this term, okay? Right. But we, we left multiply another X. Similarly, we will left multiply this x, okay? And uh, so we are having here, okay? And if we do this, we can, the right hand notation, you know, this again, avi, right? So it becomes uh, di ui, but we already have project, uh, square, so we have a project, okay? So what does this derivation tells us? Right, so this tells us that, uh, even though we are doing PCA over this thing here, but we can we can we can do some transformation. We can get our desired you no know, covariance matrix thing, right? So, uh, right. So we can get something relevant to that. Okay. So this is the DI UI and this. Right? Of course, we, we can cancel out one DI. Right? And this gives us good. Okay. So that 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 gives us this. So now what we can do is we can just do a PCA, right? We can just do a PCA over the smaller matrix, which is N by N, which is small, because now D is a lot, okay? And once we get them, what, what, what's the result of eigen decomposition on that, right? So that's a bunch of eigenvectors and associated eigenvalues, right? So, you know, these are the, uh, you know, if you do PCA on this matrix, you get the eigenvectors and the associated eigenvalues, which is, okay? And now, we, this is utilizing the property we see earlier, right? So 
you know, this, now we got VI, we can easily come to UI as AVI divided by sigma I, right, if you want, okay? So, because this is our data matrix, right? And this VI is already obtained from PCA over the smaller matrix, okay? And this DI is also obtained from the eigenvalue of that, uh, eigen right? this is the eigenvector from that smaller matrix. Right? And then we can use, utilize them and associate with the original data matrix to get here. This is actually way better because you think about this matrix, right? So this, this is a matrix times matrix, it's a huge matrix. Right? Now you don't need to go through a matrix matrix multiplication. You only need a matrix times a vector. This is way faster, okay? This is, this is a constant, by the way, okay? This is a state. So, so, so now you don't have to do the headache uh, large matrix construction and then do a PCA over there, right? You don't have to construct this large matrix. You can directly work on a smaller matrix and get VI. Uh, after getting those VI, and you can compute your according. Uh, and uh, because VI is associated with eigenvalues, where well, you can use to divide. Okay. So that's that's uh, some nice thing that you can utilize if you did this way around doing eigen decomposition is too big, right? If the PCA is too big, a uh, dimension swap in terms of size, then you can do the other way around. And then you can use a PCA, or you can use the SVD relation between you and the VI to recover uh, the other way around, okay, without uh, actually working on the larger matrix. Okay, so that's the first application, PCA for the SVD. Right? And uh, we are also applying SVD to, to do the other way around if your original coherence matrix is huge, okay? The next application would be so-called HITS algorithm. Right? So it's like a page rank, but it's uh, following a different ID. Okay? And we will take a, let me see what's the time now. Let's take a 15 minute break, okay? Uh, but be, be, be sharp, okay? I probably will come uh, 6.10, okay? And then we will wait for a couple minutes and then we will begin, okay? Uh, shoot for 6.10, uh, but we will begin no later than 15, 6.15, 15, okay? Yeah, uh, any questions? Again, I go a little bit fast if you, uh, because we will upload the video to YouTube, you can rewatch it to get the, more idea of what this is. All right, so if you have no question, I will see you in, in more than 10 minutes. Thank you.
por...
Okay, so I hope everyone is back. Let me see. Mm. All right, so let's uh, take attendance first. Okay, just uh, one moment. Where's the website? Let me pull one here. So again, because there are a lot, uh, many students, right? So we are just sample. Okay. Uh, Joshua, are you here, Joshua? Yeah, here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sai. Sai. Hi, hey, hey, sir. I'm present. Got it. Uh, Gay Gayatri. Gayatri. Yes, sir. Yes, professor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chun Yao Chen. Chun Yao Chen. Here, I'm here. Okay. Uh, uh, Shui Ping Chen. Yes, Professor, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Vivek. Vivek, are you here? Vivek. Vivek Dopalapudi. Vivek, are you here? Three times. Okay. Daniel. Here. Thank you. Uh, Varun. Hello, Professor. I'm Vivek. Okay. okay. Uh, Varun, are you here? Varun? Three times? Okay. Uh, Peda, Peda Lee? Professor, this is Varun. I'm here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, Peda Lee? Peda? Peda? No? Uh, Cole, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Sonic, Sonic, you present, sir. Harish, Harish, are you I'm here, sir? Okay. Kadi, Kadi, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. Tom, Tom, are you here? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Tom, so sorry, I, I just want to confirm. Yes, I'm here, Professor. Okay. Uh, I'm here, Professor. Uh, mm -hmm. Toner? 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 Kona Susik? Kona? No. Trenton? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So if I missed somebody, just let me know. Okay, so I can fix that. Somebody in the chat said that their microphone is not working. Oh, let me see. But 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 I I did I call call the name? Let me see. I didn't call out the name, right? So that's really strange. Okay, because you know we have uh, five students or four students joining, right? Four students joining after we take attendance. Okay, so that's a. Uh, if you you I didn't call uh, the name. But... I'm here. Okay. Uh, uh. Yeah, I will take you. Okay, so that's that's attendance for today. You're welcome. But so let's go back to the slide. So the hits algorithm is different from PageRank, but it's following this, it's basically the same application. So originally proposed for ranking website. Okay, now you can even use it for ranking other like uh, linked data, right? So like social network, et cetera. Okay, originally it's really for website, okay? So for each website, let's say we here we have four websites that are mutually linked to each other, okay? This is one website, the second, the third, this fourth, right? So you are dividing each website's functionality into two. So you basically each website, web page will be divided into two pages, okay? So I see another chat. Yeah, um, hash, I, I didn't call your name, right? So you, but anyway, so uh, just let me know if, if you are here at the end of the class. Okay, thank you, because our attendance has passed. 
Okay, so uh, so here's a you know so basically each website we will have two nodes here. Okay, and one node is acting as we, we call hub. Okay, hub. If you you look at the name, it's like a it's like a you know you know some someone broker in the middle, right? You're trading something. Right? So it's like a, you are not a directly manufacturer things, but you are. You are kind of uh, trading things, right? So you are helping people point to, hey, this is good, that is good, right? So when people come to your, your your website, if you have a lot of high quality links to good website, then your hub score is high. Okay? You, are, you are acting like a hub. Okay? Uh, a, a very good example of hub is like a Google. If you consider keyword search as well, right? so basically go to Google, and then you from Google you you do keyword search to everywhere else. But Google is like a hub. Okay? You go there one stop, and then you go to any other website. But any web, as some website are uh, uh, high quality because it's pointing to some other high quality website, right? The other are the content generating, right? So these authorities, right? those, those content is really high quality, right? So when you do a keyword search, these are the website, what page you really want. Okay? So these are the authority score, okay? So each website will have a hub score and a, a authority score, okay? And we are defining this relationship recursively uh, for, for those websites. Basically here, each link is say, hey, from web page zero to three or two, right? So you have an edge here, okay? From, so, but, but you can see that you always point from a hub node to an authority node, okay? Right, so because the edge relation, this is what we are saying, okay? For example, if you have a web page and you have some link, hyperlink URL to another page, okay? This is a page one, right? this is a page two. Uh, so, so this page one has a hub node and an authority node. But when you consider this edge, it's always from one hub node to two authority nodes. Okay? So this is uh, how you translate the hyperlinks into this part. I hope this will be clear. Any questions? If not, we will continue. Right? So here's the, uh, the concept, right? An authority means it's a web page that many hubs links to, right? If you have a lot of good hubs, their hub score are very high and they all link to you, which means you are important, right? So this is the authority score of a page. On the other hand, a hub is a page that links to many authorities, right? If you, you link to garbage websites, web pages, or you know, even uh, malicious websites, your, your hub score is gonna be low. If you link to a lot of high quality web pages, right, then your hub score will be high, okay? So they are, they are like different roles of a web page, okay? You can have a authority score super high and a hub score very low because you're not pointing to anyone else, right? So, but you, you have very good content, okay? Uh, so now let's take a look at uh, how we can represent this, right? So we, we, let's consider the web graph at a zero one adjacent symmetry, okay? Something like this. So basically, let's say if you have a web page one points to two, then you have a one here. But if you don't have a link to three, you have a zero. So this web page will be a zero one adjacent to matrix. This matrix only have zeros and ones, okay? And it's gonna be very sparse, right? Because you don't have, let's say you have one, one billion or one trillion web page overall, but each page may only point to maybe several, or at most a hundred or you know, links, right? You, you will not point to many, many, okay? So each row, you only have some ones. It's a very sparse thing. And now let's think, think about how we can, we can represent uh, our adjacency matrix, right? adjacency matrix, and also a uh, hub score vector. Right? So this hub score vector, we, we use u vector to represent this. Right? For each web page, you have a hub score. Okay? Additionally, we also have a v vector, which is for authority score. Okay? Okay, how can we compute their relationships according to our definition? Really, right? So here we we can we can think about something like this. Right? So firstly, we, we can compute u as a times v. Okay, but again, this u v are, are actually something that we want to compare just to make them unit vectors because it's a basically s v v s u v. Right? So the it's a singular vectors, right? We will see that later. Okay, so we, we don't care about the absolute value as long as they are proportionally 
meaningful, then it's fine. Right? It's 0 0.7, 0 0.5, or let's say 1.4 or 1, 1.0. Right? So that doesn't really matter. Okay. So uh, as long as that comparative importance is, is cap cap, okay, then that's fine. So we can, even if we get a very large value, we can normalize it, right? normalize this view vector to be a union vector. Okay. All right, let's take a look at what we will get. Right? So firstly, let's assume we have the A matrix here. This is the A matrix. Well, if you have a web page I, okay. But we will talk about this later. Okay, we, we first of all, we time V, right? we time V. V is, uh, you know, have a is U, right? So V is this vector. Okay. So this may be uh, so V zero the first uh, web page authority score. This is the second web page authority score. Uh, I don't know how many web page we have. Let's say V n. Okay. Now let's look at what, what is A times V. Right? Why we will get this equation? Right. So A times V gives you u, right, so this u is this, okay, this is a u, right, this is a u. Okay. So, you know, the uh, square matrix times a vector gives a u, right. So let's think about a particular u, let's say this is u1 here, okay, so the i equal to one, right. So then this row times this column will give you this value, okay, this row times this column will give you this u. Okay. So how can we regard u1 as? Right. So, so basically we are saying, hey, we have a bunch of them that has values that are totally zero, right? But if your eyes web page points to, let's say J1, okay, this page should be one, okay? And J2, then this page should be one. J3, let's say, assume they just point to these three pages, okay, then this should be one, okay? Others on this uh, green line is zero, okay? Now let's look at uh, this column, right? So basically, if you time this, this green line, with this column. The result will be very simple. Okay, so these values are zero, right? So if you time, it will be zero out. Okay. So only values that are, will, will be activated as a, you know, here is a J1, okay? Because this value times this row, this column, this one, okay? And J2, right? And J3. So these are the VJ1, VJ2, VJ3, these three values. When you take it in the product, they will be summed up, right? So basically you will have uh, VJ1 plus VJ2 plus VJ3. Okay. Why? So this is very simple, right? So here we are saying I, let's say, uh, let me change your color, okay? We are talking about this node, but it's point to three node. Let's say this node, this node, uh, sorry. This node and maybe this node. Okay. If we point to these three nodes, one, two, three, okay, then we will sum up the authority score. This makes a lot of sense, right? You are summing up those links that you point to and how authoritative they are. This gives you a link, right? If you think about another node here, maybe they point to other nodes, other links that are less authoritative because the summation of the authority score are lower, right? And then you do a proportional normalize, okay? And then this is how you get those, those scores. I hope this makes sense to you. Any questions here? Okay, if no question, we will move on. But uh, if you have any, any question, just uh, stop me and uh, we can speak for if this is normalized. And do we have a, a, another relationship? Right, so we know this is how to compute a hub score from the current authority score. Right? So there's also a authority score that is having some relation with the hub score, okay? So how, how can we see that? So we are saying that the authority score can be computed as a transpose, right? Transpose to the U, right? So, uh, so here's what it, it's saying, okay? If a lot of high quality hubs points to me, then I'm more authoritative, okay? So that's why uh, it's something something the left hand side of, okay? So you can do a similar derivation, you will see that. We, we can do the derivation here, okay? So right now we are trying to, uh, maybe we, we can do repeat this again, okay? Now we're trying to compute V, right? So V is authority score, 
authority node, which is this column. Okay. We're saying that V uh, is proportional to A transpose function. Okay. A transpose function. So we know the U is this thing. Okay. So what is A transpose after all? Right. So A transpose is something that is transpose. Right. Originally, rho is I, now column is I. So think about in this way, because we are now trying to compute uh, authority V, right? Let's say this node, okay? Now think about this, you know, I point to J, right? This node is J itself, okay? And we have maybe I1, I2, I3 pointing, okay? So that, that's where we have. So after transpose, it will be something like this, right? So So, you know, now the rows become straight. Okay, I hope you can see that. Now this row becomes straight okay, because it's the transpose. Columns becomes I, that's so I1, I2, I3. Okay, I hope you can see that. Now let's think about what is a, what is a, a transpose times U. Right? So basically we are saying what is a, this A transpose matrix times this U matrix. So think about this row. Again, this V is this V. Right? So let's think about the J's item. What's the value? Right? So this item here is equal to the J's row times this entire column. Okay. Right? And now you can see that if you, you know, these values are zero. Right? Only this value is one because of the existing value. Right? So it's really a summation over these nodes. Okay. That incoming to, to the authority disk. And similarly, if you have another node, but their incoming uh, hub score sum up is smaller, of course, it's less authoritative than this one. Okay. So that's the idea of hits. So basically we have two equations that describes the relationship between authority and uh, you know, hub, okay, the reality. Again, this is also proportional, which means we will normalize it in the univariate. Okay. And this process can alternate, right? So first we compute A, V, Right. And then it can start from a random V. Right? So then we get a U and then normalize U and put here and we compute A transpose U and get a V. And normalize, right? make it a unit vector and then come back, put here and normalize U. And we repeat until we converge. Okay. So that's what HITS is doing, basically the algorithm is doing, right? Any questions so far? This is the, the scenario we are discussing. If that, you have any question, just feel free to ask. So if we, we, we think about this way, right? So how can we compute the authority score, right? We can, we can just replace this V with this, right? A, T, A, U. Then we know that your authority score is proportional to A, T, A, U, okay? Because this constant is uh, divided, right? So you have, even if you have multiple, multiple rounds, but they are this constant, okay? It's the same constant, right? I mean, uh, each round you have a constant. And all the rows are divided by the same kind. And similarly, if you look at V, it's a, it's similar, right? If you V is A transpose U with some constant, right? So constant is hiding U. Okay? But this U is a, another AV. So you can treat it like this. Okay? So what does this tell us? What does this tell us? So let's 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 look at it in another way. If we, we regard this as another matrix B, let's say our power method, okay? And this is equal to a constant, lambda times right? B. So we are saying if we regard A, A transpose as the matrix, it's, it's gonna be a square matrix, right? You know, you know the shape, okay? Right. And then, you know, U is an eigenvector, okay? And lambda is an eigenvalue of B, okay? Similarly, if you treat this as B, then V is an eigenvector of this B. Right. And the, 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 if you, you think about constant, which we really don't care, it's not just computing the U and V, the, the, the lambda will be there, I can have. I hope this will be clear. Okay. So now it's not pretty obvious how we compute this, right? But if you remember, we can do any matrix A, we can do SVD, so we, we just assume this U diagonal matrix V transpose, right? Then what will be A transpose times A, right? We care about this because it's 
it's a, a transpose times a this matrix where the eigenvalue is written. Right? So then we can write this is a similar to our derivation. A transpose will be something like this, right? And then we have this. And this U transpose times U will cancel out, become the identity matrix. And these two, these two are diagonal matrix, right? Transpose of a diagonal matrix itself. And this will become S square, basically. And we can write it as sigma. Okay. And similarly, if you write the other way around, right? So the other U's uh, matrix B, right? So it will be something like this. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that, you know, this is a, uh, you know, if you want to get U and B, right? And it's going to be the first eigenvector for A, A transpose or A transpose A, okay? So basically we are saying that your U, okay? Remember this U and V are corresponding to this, uh, U is a hub and V is a third, okay? So that vector of U, for example, would be, if you do SVD, right, on A, you will get a matrix with UV. You get a U matrix. This is U one. Okay, this is the first uh, single value. Of U. Similarly, if you you have S and you have a V, this is V one transpose. Right? So this V one, the first A V would be the you know the authority score. Okay, the first this is authority score of the first page. This is a hub score of the second page, third page, end page. Okay, this is the authority score of the first page, second page. So, okay, you just look at the first. Uh, V1 and uh, U1, okay, then, then that's the result. Okay, so you may, may query why, why it's the first one, not the second one, right? If you think about our power iteration master, right, if you repeat, basically, basically we are saying that you are repeating, repeating this operation, right? So, you, so basically you have an initial matrix vector, then you time this B and time B again, time B again, time B again, right? Ultimately, according to our power iteration master, you will Get the most uh, significant single vector. Okay, so that's why it's it's the first one. According to yeah. Okay, so these are uh, first the uh, adding vector and the end one will be our score. Yeah. So what does this tell us? This tells us that we don't need to do two complicated things, right? So if we know the eigen decomposition, really, we just get u one as a, a hub score and v one as a score. Yeah. So this is a uh, why, why it's a singular vector? Because you have the power method. The result will be the first singular uh, vector, okay? Left or right, depending on whether it's hub or so. Okay, so, but actually we need to do the computation anyway, right? We, we can do the power iteration uh, like before, but uh, there's a simpler method. Right? So basically they are equivalent. Okay, this is called a, a clean birth iterative algorithm. So we'll repeat these operations. Firstly, if your U and V had a match, right, so then all those neighbor J's that you, you point to, right, the hub point to, you just sum their current uh, authority scores, then you will get U, right? And then given those UIs, right? So then you compute VI. You basically update the old VI to new VI. You compute the, the VI as, you know, the, the newly complete UI and then if you have an add from this i to your vj. I think I add all those neighbors, i pages. Okay. And you're repeating this, right? So you can see that uh, here, each iteration, the vi will be updated. Okay. But next iteration, ui will be updated. Right? So because this update uh, used and this update. Okay. So each iteration will update ui and vi. Yes. Now we don't even need to think from the matrix perspective. We are basically considering one row as uh, that gets this column vector like this pattern. Right? And then we need to normalize them. Right? So if you remember, we need to normalize. We don't need to normalize here before doing this because it's a constant, right? So we can just do the normalizing as again, okay? Because there are so many UIs. Right? We don't want to do it for everyone. Once we get these uh, results, then we just normalize. Make, some, make sure they are union vectors, and then we can repeat the process. The reason we normalize them is really because, you know, when we think about the web pages, it's gonna be super large matrix, maybe one trillion by one trillion. Okay? We really don't want the eigenvalues part to cause stability issues. Okay? So remember, we, we really don't care about what the eigenvalues are, right? what's in S. We just want to, what's S squared. Okay? We just want the first U and the first V. 
So then you just, uh, each iteration, you normalize them. Whatever the eigenvalue is, you just uh, absorb them into the normalization. Okay. And that, that would be the result. Okay, so that basically completes our two SVD applications, right? So the first is PCA, the second is PITS. Okay, they are all uh, basically uh, relies on SVD to do the validation. Okay, of course you can directly use eigen decomposition, and uh, they are kind of equivalent. I hope that this will familiarize you with SVD and how you can utilize it. Right? So you can always assume your SVD can be decomposed. Like this, right? That's pretty nice. Okay? And then you can derive some properties because you know these these metrics are very special. They can cancel. This is about no, and uh, potentially in your research problem that you study. If you do SVD, then to the derivation, you can get something really interesting. Assuming that SVD can be easily done by a, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, secular, or I'm not sure, it's, it should be statistic package, right? It's not in secular, but anyway, so there's a SVD packet, right? So you can direct call the library. In MATLAB, we also have SVD, that was straightforward. Okay. But the algorithm is probably running the power iteration method. And there are some references and uh, on papers, including like the CKDD and those top conferences. But they, this may be a little bit outdated. So, uh, uh, yeah, so here are some examples. Right. So, another in interesting topic is called a matrix completion. Right? So, which means, you know, here we are assuming a complete matrix. Okay. But what if your matrix is not complete? Right? So, let's say the, this is a, for example, recommendation system, uh, NACLIF. Netflix, a user is rating these three movies they watch, okay? Or TV series. Another user is uh, rating these, okay? But you don't have all the data. Right? How, how do you do recommendation? Right? So what you can do is you do a matrix factorization. Right? This matrix is too big, but we can continue a, a lower rank, okay? Which means uh, the R is reduced to K, and then we time them back. We can even add an SVD if you want. Okay? Or we can directly assume which W is. And we want to find this such that after recovering from this, right, these values are kind of similar to what you observe. But because when you recover them, you will have some other values, right? Because now you turn them back, the other originally you're missing data will also have values. Then you can say, hey, if this score is really high, I also recommend maybe the, this movie to the, to the user, even though he has not watched that, right? Because it's likely it's this user will like it. This is based on so-called a manifold theory. Okay, but when we actually do this kind of matrix factorization, we don't really don't need that theory. But it's saying that high dimensional, let's say one million users, maybe one million, uh, you know, movies. It doesn't matter because it's uh, regulated by k factors. Okay, okay. so you, you can use just a k rank k to capture all these information. Right? So then you can recover some of the so that's the idea, but this is called a matrix completion because you don't see the entire matrix. Right? So you are just uh, optimized on what you see to be close after recovery. Okay, and then you rely on these recover uh, these uh, U, V, and maybe singular, uh, maybe the sigma to recover the other values. Okay? So this is the algorithm called a SVT. Right, this is called a threshold. Okay? It's not SVD anymore because it's a matrix completion where you don't have the complete matrix. Okay, SVD assume you have the entire matrix values. So that's kind of different. And there's also, you know, no matter what, the matrix is only uh, considered two dimensional case, right? So you have a I and a J, right? So, but in reality, you can have multi-model data, right? So, which means you have multiple modes. Right? So this is like a, you have one mode with I, like customers, and one mode is J, which is product, a movie, or, you know, Amazon, product, right? So you have a K, like which time you buy in the day, right? so, uh, uh, seven to eight, et cetera. Right? So you have three modes and you can do the do the factorization just like SVT okay? or even SVD. Right? And then you have some missing value, you can recover them. And you can, you can see whether at that time for that customer, we should uh, recommend that product. Okay? So this kind of uh, tensor decomposition is uh, also very popular, but right? each dimension is called a mode, okay? an OD. And uh, we often have this word, uh, much model, right? and you, uh, so, so this mod module, right? So it's not a mo model. It's uh, it's it's a the adjective form of mode. So each mode is each dimension. In reality, this can correspond to different 
meaningful objects, right? So customers, the products, and the time, etc. So you, you can even have high dimensional, like so the, the, the time of the day and, uh, you know, and the time of the day in the week, etc. Then you can have four dimensional transitions, right? And uh, yeah, so, so this was uh, earlier, we have a class where we have some presentations, but uh, now the, there are so many students, it's, it's not possible to do a presentation for each student. Right? So basically, if you have interest, you can look into tensor factorization, like decomposition. Right? So there's a tertiary decomposition, which is similar to SVD. Okay? Remember SVD, we have U, we have a diagonal matrix, we have a V. Right? So in three dimensional, you will have this. Right? In four dimensional, you may have another one. Then it comes with code. And there's also parallel fact decomposition. You don't have the kernel kind of thing in the middle, right? So it's all rank one factors come together and sum them up. Okay. And uh, yeah, so I will uh, skip this, but uh, just to keep you aware, there are several concepts. Right? So firstly, you can go beyond the matrix. You can do tensor. Okay. Secondly, besides the complete matrix, you can have the missing values. And so, and the majority can be missing. You have a sparse matrix, you can do the completion problem using these kinds of values. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of this slide. Any questions? Okay, so if not, let's continue. Uh, let me see. Again, so in real life, if you, you, you know these ideas, you can just call libraries, like Parafac and the tertiary decomposition, they all have libraries. Okay. You don't have to write your own, but if you want to practice, you can write your own. Okay. So the next slide will be a preparation, but preparation for our uh, next, uh, you know, next topic, which is uh, streaming algorithms. Okay. It has a lot of thing to do the, with randomization, randomized algorithms. So we need to have some inequality and property bounds concepts uh, like uh, presented here. So you, you know that uh, what uh, like uh, computer science people are commonly using, which are the inequalities you memorize, etc. Okay. And once you know them, it's just like a calculus, right? If you memorize them and see them a hundred times, it's pretty obvious to you, um, hey, this time I should use it. Right? Um, but uh, just like you, how you take a derivative when you take the calculus exam. But if you, you know, just to see it twice, maybe you don't even memorize it. So we are trying to cover those things systematically. Then next time you see it, you will recognize it. Okay. So the first uh, inequality we have seen that before. Right? So one plus x is less than e to the power. Okay. This holds for any x in the real domain. Okay. Except for zero, because zero you see the left hand and right hand side are all one. So this should be a quality. Okay. So if you, you this should be less than or equal. Well, when, when it's equal, x is zero. Basically, that's the point. So one plus x, you know, this is x equal to y, right? What is x, y equal to one plus x? So this you shift up, okay? So you shift up to this location, right? Okay? That's y equal to one plus x. What is y equal to e to the power x, right? This is this straight, I hope you know this, right? So and then go infinite to close to zero, right? And this is zero because you know e to the power zero is one. Okay. And this this is exactly forty five degree. Okay, this is forty five degree. X equal to y, right? So it's this this coefficient is one, so that's forty five degree. But here, if you want to divide this forty five degree, just think about it, right? So this take the derivative is two ex. Okay, this is what you're learning. Back. And then this is a is a slope at this point. This slope at the point is what? Right? Because you, this point is zero. So it's still 45. This means that everything, so this is just to help you memorize this. Everything that in the red curve will be larger. Okay? It's a bow. This is larger, right? Except in this point, zero, when they do it. Right? And this holds not only from zero to positive infinity, it also holds from zero to negative infinity. It's always above. E to the power x is always above one plus x, no matter whether it's positive x or negative x, right? So this means if you give minus x here, right, it's still whole. So that's why we have the second conclusion. Right, so, so it's, it's the same reason, okay? You just define y equal to 
minus x. Right? That's become one plus y e to the power y. Right? Y and minus x are in the same domain. It's just a negator. Right? Another common C equation is something like this. Right? You can take ln on left hand side and take ln on right hand side. Right? Ln and the e will cancel. So it's going to be x. It's going to be larger than ln one minus. X. So this basically is derived from. I, I don't recall whether we will use this here, but uh, yeah, this is also useful because if you do machine learning, log likelihood, right? So this log is always here. And if you see this, see through this, and then it will be easier for you. But another uh, equation we, we have used when, if you remember how we sampled the, uh, uh, we were talking about the power iteration method, right? So how we sample a point randomly, sample the d dimensional vector randomly to do the B and D can be, uh, okay? And we want to show finally it's the uh, first uh, singular vector, the V1. There we actually used this conclusion already. This is called the generalized Bernoulli inequality, okay? So if you have one plus X to the power alpha, it's gonna be larger than equal to one plus. Uh, so this is a pretty obvious, frankly speaking, because you know, it's like if it's square, it's one plus three X plus X squared, right? So the square is always one. Right? Three times, and it's a three x, three x square, and then x cubed. Okay, right. so we always have these two terms when you do the Taylor expansion, right? And uh, the other terms is gonna be positive, positive, non-negative. Right? So that's why you this side will be larger. Okay, but this only holds if alpha is less than zero and the negative one. So it's some, some one divided by this, or if alpha is larger than one. Okay. In the special case where alpha is something in between, let's say it's one by two, like square root of this, right? Then the, the, the sign when it will be reversed, okay? And again, you know, the equality only, only holds if the x is zero, which means left hand side and right hand side are zero. Right? Anything to the power of zero is one. Okay? And this, this is one plus zero, that's possible. Okay. I hope you can see this. And these two conclusions we, will, we might use again. Especially the previous one, as I, I'm pretty sure we will be using. Yeah. yeah, again, so these things, if you see a hundred times, you will be comfortable. Yeah. So we will basically, we will see this a lot of times, then you will, you will, you, 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 you kind of like a muscle memory, right? So you will immediately get it. Okay. So there's also uh, both formula, right? So, uh, so that's. It, it, you should already know this, right? So if you have two step A union B, right? So you use a Wynn diagram, you have A and B, and you have some intersection, right? So you, A union B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B right, plus C, minus the intersection AB, okay? Right. So which means you will have A circle plus B circle. But because of this intersection part is counted twice, right? when you compose it, you need to minus that. Thing, okay? right. so, but this thing can generalize, right? If you don't have just A1, A2, you have N terms, then you can follow the Bose formula, which is something like this. Okay? One term and minus intersection two terms and plus two terms three terms. This is a combinatorial number. And so you see N3, this is CN2. So this thing can be proved by induction, but we, we were just, uh, because it's not a mass cost, right? So it's a applied mass cost. Right? So we were just uh, give the solution. Another thing is a uh, uh, union bound. Okay, this is super useful, right? So, so this is what, what we are saying is that, let's think about your one diagram, right? You have an A1 here, right? events A1, A2, A3. If you have no intersection, you sum them up, it will be equal to summing the areas. Okay? But what if, what if you have some uh, intersection? Right? So for example, your A3 is here, then so you have some intersection. So then this is why this is the upper bound. Right? If you still sum their three square, three you know, circles area, right? it will be upper bound of the union because the union actually is something like this. So using word diagrams, more obvious, right? You have these two double conflict. Okay? So this is always a upper bound. If you have these things union, 
in the worst case, right? So it just uh, don't uh, count that intersection to a okay. This thing seems pretty loose though, right? Because you know the probabilities can sum up to beyond one. Okay. But in some cases, this unibound is pretty helpful, especially if your each probability is really a very, very small. Number. Then the union bond is still time. Okay, we will see that. And uh, so, uh, so union bond basically holds for any any set, any event. Okay, but what if your events, that event one, event two, event three, are so called mutually independent? Which means if E two happens, then E one cannot happen. Right? So they are they are they are mutually independent. Okay, so in that case, you can you, you can have this here. So it's like uh, you have flip a coin, different times you flip, it's different event, right? So, so this is, uh, you can compute like this, right? So, so think, about, think about it. What is E1, E2, E3, E K, right? If they are totally independent. So they can happen together, uh, my bad. Right? So E1 can happen and E2 also will happen, right? So this is one, one, right? zero, assume it's not happening, okay? One, one, zero, et cetera. a lot of cases, right? So one, 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 zero, or one, one, zero, zero, et cetera. So there's only one case that is not step transitive. Right? So which means all of them are not holding. Right? None of them are holding. This is all relationship. Right? If all zero, then this is not holding. Okay. So what's the probability that that will happen? Because everything is independent, right? So if this if E1 fails, it's one divided by the success probability. Here, okay. E2 fails, is one divided minus the failure probability E2. Okay. And then all of them fails, it's an end relationship. Right, it's an opposite of the orange. Right? It's an E1 bar and E2 bar. Okay? For end relationship of independent events, we can take the product. Okay? That's the case that every event is not happening. Okay? But that's a case that we want to rule out because at least uh, one event happened, then it's E1 or E2 or E2. Right? So then we have total probably 100% minus this product. Okay? That's why this one, one is 100 but this thing is tighter. Right? This thing is way tighter than this. This is just summing all their probabilities. Okay? It can go beyond one. This is way tighter. But you can only use this if it's independent. Okay? Let's say I, I flip a coin. The first time it's half. The second time it's half. The third time it's half. Right? And then you know the probability. This is all of the tails. Okay, it's not half. And right? then you fail. Okay? As long as we see one half, then you succeed. You see two half, ten half, they are all succeeding. Right. But this is based on assumption that you flip coin independent. This time you, you succeed or not, doesn't depend on previous time. Okay. In that case, you can use this bond. Only in that independent trial case, you can use the, this tighter bond. Okay. This is tighter. Otherwise, you have to use the union bond, which uh, is uh, valid in all cases. Any question? All right, so if this is fine. So uh, do you make sure, because that time we will go through the, the streaming algorithm, we will, we will heavily utilize these bounds, okay? Try to memorize them if you can. Okay. If not, probably you need to watch the video and uh, refresh your mind. Okay. So these are the, the union, these are the simple bounds, okay? And what this lecture really want to cover are the advanced inequalities that can be proved in this. So they are Markov inequality, Chebyshev inequality, large, a lot of large numbers and chunk of bonds. Okay. Especially uh, these, these three inequalities, these three bonds. Okay. These three are Markov, Chebyshev and chunk of bonds. Okay. These three are the foundation of randomized algorithm. Whenever, let's say, because we don't have a specialized course on randomized algorithm, but if you have a randomized algorithm course, right, these three are, like ABC, you should know. Okay, so the first thing you know. So we are covering these inequalities. So firstly, again, here we are probably because we are continuing to randomize the event. So which means uh, we will have some technique to avoid the worst case. So you assume that the random error. Okay. So let's first review some concepts. Okay. So firstly is expectation. So you have a random variable X, but it can take different values with different probabilities, right? And uh, so what will be the expectation? 
So I think this is the pretty much in probability theory. You have already seen that. So you take this value, but the probability is this. You take that value, probably that. You just time the value with the probability, sum them up. Okay, that's an expected value, right? So it's like if you take a value one with uh, 80%, you take a value zero with 20%. Right? So your value is 0 0.8, okay? Right? Because this is zero times 20 and one. Uh, again, this should be developed by one It's probability. Okay. So this is an expectation. And expectation, actually, there's a property called the linearity of expectation, which holds in any case. There's no assumption between the two random variables, x and y. Okay. So if you have constant, you can take it out. And you have a summation of two random variables. The expectation, you can, you can just sum their individual expectation. And here we are talking about a, a discrete value, the random value, which means it, it's a, it can take a, it's one, it can take it's two, it can use this one. Okay. But there are also some random variables that are continuous, like the Gaussian distribution, right? The mu, mean is a random one, but you can take any value. It's an uncountable infinite domain. Okay. This is a countable, right? So this is even more infinite. Okay. And in that case, you have to do the integral. So it's not a simple summation to handle. So here we are saying that uh, this summation, if your variable is continuous, you have to use integral, okay? And we will see an example later. We are derived using, using an integral because it's more generalized, but uh, so the discrete case is more easy to, more intuitive for you. Yeah. So the second concept is uh, uh, we have seen it a couple of times, the variance, right? So each random value minus expected value is a bias square. And uh, you have multiple data points. You need to take the expectation of all the data points. That's a value, okay? And uh, we, we, we have seen this rule. Uh, so basically, we, uh, let me see. So you should have me memorized this rule, your variance. You can write it like this. You can also write it like this. Uh, so your, your variable square, so if you run a variable square, you take the expectation, minus your expectation square. That's a value. But how to see that? Actually, we see this many times. If you see this a hundred times, you are pretty sure this is correct. So here, uh, this is the following definition. Right? So it's, this is a, a minus b squared. Right? It's equal to a squared plus b squared okay? minus two ab, okay? But using the linearity of expectation, right? The expectation of the whole thing is equivalent to take individual expectation. So we take expectation of this one, we have instead of this one, but this one, you know, this is a constant, right? it's a new value, a, a mean value. Okay, so you can, expectation is constant. Okay. Then you actually take expectation with this value. Okay, and then start with this, because this is a constant, then you, you know, this doesn't matter. Okay? So now let's just look at this term. Right, because this is a constant, you can take, take it out. Okay? And then you have ex, ex, which is two, three x. So minus twice this and a plus back one of this. Right? It's like one minus one, right? So that's why you have this conclusion. So put simply, uh, you, this always holds, right? So your, this even holds when x is vector. You see that before, except that you need to take this as a transpose, E transpose times E, okay? But because the variance is a matrix, covariance matrix. So here, just keep in mind, so your, your random variables variance is equal to your random variable square, the expectation minus your expectation square, okay? Another thing is uh, uh, glory that you, you, if you have constant here, uh, in expectation, you just take it out. But it's for variance, because there's a square, so it takes the C out, C out, and you need to pass the square, okay? So you have a C square. And we, we, we told you that if this is a matrix, this is a vector, then this should be C and a C transpose. Right? So that's a generalized, generalized form if X is a vector, okay? Any questions? If not, we will move on, okay? All right, so this is what we just discussed, linearity expectation. If you have a, a bunch of random variables, sum together and take the expectation, okay? It's equivalent to you just uh, sum their expectation, okay? You can, you can take to each individual. Right? 
So we have a similar property for variance. Okay. Right. So this is called the linearity of variance. But this time, it doesn't hold for any exam. Okay. You have to make sure there are so-called powers independent, which means if you give any two random variables, i, x, j. Right. So they are, you know, x, i is not dependent on x, i. Okay. So basically, they are independent. So P X I X J is equal to P X I times P X J. It's not a like P X I times conditional X I minus J. So that's what it independent means. But we only need a pairwise. Later in, in the next topic, we will see we, we, in one particular case, we need a fourwise independent. X I X J X K X L, they are all independent. Pairwise is only needed because variance is based on, you know, covariance is based on only two variables, but I and the J. It's still, because the matrix itself is not a tensor, it's still just a, a considering two modules, okay? So next let's look at our first inequality that we care about. Okay, so, so this first is called a Markov inequality. And uh, this is simplest form, but right? if you only know your random variable X expectation value, then Markov inequality can come into play, okay? If you additionally know beyond the expectation, you know something else, let's say your variance, then Chebyshev inequality can come into play, give you a tighter upper bound, okay? So this upper bound is really loose. Okay? If you don't know anything else, like the, what's the distribution of the x, but you know that's the expectation, you can all, always bound it, okay? So nothing is more important than memorize this formula, right? So that you can use it. We will prove it, but it's more important to utilize. So what, what do we have here? How to visually consider this? Right. So first is this x, this uh, random variable has to be non-negative. Right? So in the real world, it's, it's more like as a count, right? For example, how many times, you know, the bus passed through this, uh, you know, bus stop. It cannot be negative, okay? So this is, uh, has to be a meaningful positive random variable. This is the first thing you need to know. S secondly, you need to know its expectation. Right? On average, uh, each day you have maybe 20 buses pass through this bus stop, okay? In that case, then you can easily say, hey, now I know that uh, each day 20 bus will pass through this stop, okay? But how, how likely will have 100 bus pass through this stop? It's, it's very unlikely. Right? So what if you have this A to be a large number, 100, okay? But the number of buses is 100, then you can say, hey, expecting 20, right? But uh, you, you say, so, so, so this is a really large value, that's 100. This is very unlikely, this is 20, okay? The larger, the more unlikely, right? Because the closer to 20, the more likely, okay? So this is really a bond to say, hey, if your number is ridiculously large, the code is uh, gonna be dropped with this number, okay? So this is a really a very, very primitive number. Uh, as long as you know the expectation, you can bond the, the probability that can be much, much larger than what you want. All right, so let's take a look at the proof of this inequality. So again, here we are now considering, because we don't know x is discrete or continuous, right? So we play safe, we use continuous. And because this is non-active, we take an integral from zero. Okay? This is a probability that you will take, that is a PDF, probability density function. Okay? And you have the dx because the probability is summation, right? So it's uh, your current value, but your, your, your density here. Um, this is the definition of expectation. And you can split them into two. So the, the range is zero to A, then from A to infinity. Okay, you split them into two ranges. But keep in mind, because this value is positive, that probability is positive, this term is always going to be positive, at least not negative. X could be zero. Let's say you have some distribution start from A to B. Okay. So this is going to be larger than or equal to if you just consider the second term. Now, when you think about the integral, right? So this x is going to be from a to infinity. So the smallest possible value is a. Right? If you just make all the value here to be small as a, then you can take this a off. Okay? But again, this is larger than a. Right? If you look at this term here, this is exactly your, the probability of your value is larger than a. Okay? But this is a density starting from a to any value that's exactly. So this thing is exactly the probability. 
that your value is like, okay, following the definition of cumulative property, a CDF. Is this P is P. Okay. But with decimal function. There's a cumulative distribution. So, and the null, uh, we have this thing, then it's pretty clear. So A times the probability is smaller than or equal to expectation, bounded by expectation. Then you, you divide this A here. Okay. Then you got this one on the right hand side. And this probability is. Okay. And the question about this derivation. Okay, I hope this will be fine. Okay. Oh, by the way, we will not be able to finish this slide, I believe, for today. We will have the second half for next week. Okay, so our written assignment will be for two weeks. Okay. Uh, most of the questions you can already answer them, but there will be probably one or two that you have to wait till the other week. But at least you can start uh, finishing some of the questions in the sum. Okay. All right, so the next is a Markov inequality. And uh, so, uh, so, so, so this is the same Markov inequality, right? But you can, you can write it in a more meaningful way, right? So what, what does it mean by ridiculously large, right? So your expectation, let's say ex, right? if you are, you are b times larger than you expected by, right? We say that 20 buses, we say now what's the probability we have more than 40 buses, right? Okay, this is twice that. Okay, if we say it's a, a five times the expected value, then it's a, let me see, I, I kind of lose my mind. So I get it back. Right. So it makes more sense if you replace A with B epsilon, right? If we do this, then this becomes B epsilon, okay? And if you cancel epsilon, this becomes one by B. So this makes more sense. It says, if your expected value is 20, right, what's the probability if you are B times more than 20? The probability one by B. It's gonna be slow, smaller than the B. This is a corollary, right, because it's, a, it's straightforward from here to here. It's first, you prove this, like in your previous slide, and once you, you have this, this is pretty obvious. Okay. So throughout those inequalities, we are really caring about how far away you can be away from your expected value. Right? We want to show that if you expect value here, you are not likely to be here. That's ridiculous this line, okay? So that's what the intuition for the inequality is. And it's also use case, right? When you want to use the inequality, it's really one, you want to show that your random variable is not gonna be much, much, many, many times larger than expected, okay? Let me see the time. All right, so the next is, the Chebyshev inequality. Again, the first thing is not to see how to prove this. Okay? It's to see what this means and how you want to use it. Right? So this time, we can see x is a random variable. Right? So uh, I just want to somehow. Yeah. X is a random variable, but can be any random variable, which means you don't have to be a, a positive random variable. You can be a Gaussian distribution where you can go from negative infinity to positive. And uh, we are again caring about this, right? How far away you are from your expected value, right? So this is the absolute value. So you can be on either side of the expected value. Let's say you are new, you can be either side here, right? But uh, how likely you will go beyond your new by C, radius C, right? You will be here, then it's very unlikely. You are likely within this. Right? If you think about Gaussian, right? It's like within three standard deviation. Beyond three standard deviation, it's very unlikely. So that's the intuition that this equation talk about. If you are too ridiculously larger than your expected value, or too far away from that, it's gonna reduce projective times, okay? But what's on top this time is a variance, okay? So what it tells you is that if you look at the previous inequality, right, so Markov inequality, all you need is the expectation, right? But here in, uh, in championship inequality, of course you need to know your expectations so you can kind of how far away you are. And additionally, you need to know the variance of your random variable. So if you, you really can compute your variance, you should use Chebyshev inequality because this is tighter, okay? You use more information. If you don't know the variance, you only know the expected, expected value, then you should use, a, you know, use an E, okay? So sometimes you can compute the variance. Right? So 
So for the previous case, the bus stop where the exposition distribution, you know how to compute the variance. If you don't know, the, the distribution can be any shape. Variance can be huge. But in that case, you, you can just use uh, you mark up in coin. If you know the variance, you can use chubby in coin. All right, so let's see how we can prove this. So, uh, you know, if you, you have this right, left, left hand side, larger than left, right hand side, right? both are called non negative values. And uh, then you can square them. Right? So you square them the, because they both are positive. Right? You square them, the, the direction doesn't change. Okay? So then the nice thing about it is that if you treat the left hand side, right? you treat this thing as another random variable. Right? Because x is random, then the system is one. Y is it. Okay? So this y is now negative, right? So because something square, right? and mostly it cannot go to the negative side. Then this becomes our uh, becomes our Markov inequality, right? You have some positive number larger than some value, uh, smaller equal to the transition of this y. Okay. So we are using this this conclusion. Yeah. So you are larger than this value. Right? Is uh, is equal to the expectation of your y. Okay. This is y again. Divide by this constant. This original is a, now you want it done. Right, so this is how you get from there to here. And now then you, you, can, you can see another thing is this term. Right? This term is exactly the variance, right? So you know this absolute value and the press is the same because quadratic after quadratic it's always positive. Okay? And this is exactly the definition variance. So this basically to prove the championship in quality, you construct a new random variable. That's just non active, and then you, you use a Markov input, you can prove. Okay. So apparently, it's going to be tighter than Markov input. Okay. And you can see that here, this basically can prove the conclusion right? from here to here. Any questions? Okay. Today is pretty mass heavy, so I assume you will uh, go back to the video or the slides. So again, there's a corollary, which, uh, which is derived from here, because now just think about it, right? So how far away you are from the standard deviation? Okay, the C, we care about C times the standard deviation, right? Because variance square root is standard deviation, right? If you think about Gaussian, three times the standard deviation, it's, it's almost everything, okay? So now if, we, you know, this C is not a comparable, right? If you use standard deviation, you, you kind of have constant. Now, if we, we just, uh, let, let's write this as A, okay? Then A squared, okay, then, then it's easier to see. Right? Now let's assume A is equal to, equal to this, okay? C times squared. Then A squared is equal to what? Is equal to C, but this square, C squared, okay? And this square root variance becomes there. Okay? And this variance and this constant. That's why you have one divided by C squared. Okay. So this is how you, you go from here to here. But again, keep in mind that C should be a positive number, right? so because we have this is a distance from the you know the mu band. Okay. It's, it's going to be a positive distance to the mu. So now you can see that this is a, like a how far away from the mean value you are in terms of the number of times of the standard deviation, it's got to be bounded by C squared. Right? This decreases faster because if it's two squared four, right? If it's four times the square is 16, because this decreases very fast, okay? even faster than Markov. Okay, so All right, I hope uh, this is fine. Next uh, one is a uh, quite a straightforward uh, extension of the Chapman inequality. It's called the law of large numbers, okay? The law of large numbers. So here we are using the independent assumption, right? independent assumption. And so here, what we are saying that, he, hey, we have a random variable, then we will draw from this distribution n values, okay? Then we want to, we want to estimate the mean value using the average, okay? So that's why we, we draw this value and then take an average. And this average is a sample average. Right? This is the ground truth mean. So how far away there? Right? 
we hope if we take a lot of ants, okay, we, we take a Henry samples, then it's very close. To, uh, if we take a, a 10,000 sample, it's pretty much the okay? So here we really, here, Ipsilon is a very small one. Right? What's the probability that after taking so many independent samples, like the point, right, the expected value is still not so accurate. Right? So let's say your, your, your point is, head is 50%, tail is 50%. Right? So if you flip how many heads right, and the total times, right, it's gonna be very close to if it's a uh, 51%, then you have 1% error. So how likely you have the 1% here? We want to show that uh, the probability is decreasing with n. Right? If you, you try more, right? this is called a large number, log line. You try more, you can bring this, this probability that you break this, this you, you go beyond the by epsilon, it's very small. Okay? It's unlikely. It's more likely you are very close to it. So as long as you, you try more and you, you try more draws of the distribution, then the variance can be, this bound can be really low. Okay? The probability you break this rule is going to be low. All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at how we can prove this. Another thing that this is your error bound you can tolerate, right? This error bound is impacting you. Let's say you, you can tolerate 10%, right? 10% error, which is 0.1. Then this becomes 0.01, 1%. So which means you, you kind of times 100 on top, right? So this is a one by 100, okay? Then you need the n to be time a factor of 100 to cancel this, this error bound, okay? So basically you can use more n to cancel the, the how tight you want, right? okay? Okay, how can we see this? We can prove this by chubby strap inequality, okay? Let's see how we prove this. According to chubby strap inequality, here we are treating this random variable as y, okay? Why, how far away are you from your, your expectation, right? So this, you may, you may say that, hey, this is not expected y, this is apparently x, right? But we can show that they are the same, right? So you just use linear expectation, right? Your y is equal to expectation of this, right? And uh, it's equal to expectation of each item, okay? So this, this will be your n times your expectation. And divide by n. Okay, it's still your mean. Basically, your e x and e y are the same. You can show this. I hope you can see that. And in this case, you know, so championship of quality, we, we told you, right? So this is the variance of this y divided by what's here, right? the c c square. Okay. I hope you can see that according to what we just described, the championship of quality. Let's go back to championship of quality just in case you forget. So this is uh, how far away you are from your expectation and you put your variance to the other distance square, okay? Right, so I hope you can see the relationship between them. Okay, so now let's take a look at how we compute it, right? So, so you know, this constant we take out if they are in square, okay? They are in square. And uh, then you have variance of these. And rem remember, we have a linearity of variance if these are independent drops, pairwise independent. Right? So this becomes variance of them, but you know, this is from the same distribution, it's n times the variance. Right? And there, there's a, this basically n times the variance. Okay, this n cancels with the one n here. Right? So this gives us a conclusion, right? because this is on the right hand side. We have to our, what we want to prove is basically this thing is that thing equal to this thing. Okay? So we basically prove the law of large numbers. All right, so we only have five minutes left. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Yeah, so this linear decay with n. So if you want it to be more accurate for your average value, you take more samples. Okay? So this will decrease quickly. Right? If you just have one sample, it's going to be something like variance divided by that. If you take one thousand samples, that that bound can be bring down by one thousand. The probability will go down quickly. Okay. That breaks it. Okay. Next is channel of bound. Okay. We won't have time to go through the proof. We will go through a proof next time. Okay. And of course, you can read the slide to to do the assignment first. But let's just look at what is channel of bound first. Okay. We understand the inequality. 
and then next time we draw the proof. Okay. So here it's the same as love life numbers. You have independent random variables, x minus two x n, right? And each time you succeed, like flip coin succeeded with p, failure with one minus p. Okay. So now consider a summation. Right? Each time you try the same distribution thing, that right? you succeed with probably p. Now you try n times. But how many times you will succeed? That's uh, this is the intuition for s. Okay, it's a summation. So what's the expected value of this s? Right? So what's the expected value of this? Right? Because it's a random variable function. Right? This, each one is a random variable. You have n of them. So it's pretty much obvious. Right? So this this expected value we denoted by n. Right? N is the expected value of s is equal to mg. Okay, how do you see that? By linearity of expectation, this i equal to one to n expectation of xi, right? And expectation of xi is p, okay, because it's a Bernoulli variable. If you cannot see that, you just have to think about the value times one minus p, that equal to zero, plus the value times p, which is p, okay? And then you sum them up. This gives you p, which you expect. Okay. So this term is p. Uh, and you have n times this term, so this n g. But I hope you can see that. I uh, maybe we leave it here. Just in case. Okay. So now what we are talking about is that what's the probability that right? your summation is actually a little bit larger than this, right? larger than this by depth, twenty percent. This could be twenty percent, zero point two. This is going to be bounded by something. Right, and uh, so this may be looking crazy, right? This term. Okay, we we will discuss the details on how to comprehend this term and how to simplify this term next time. Okay? And uh, this is basic intuition that we can actually bound this. This term is actually very tough. That's why chain of bound is super useful in random algorithm. But right now it looks crazy. So we will continue next next week, next Tuesday. All right, so we only have two minutes uh, to, to continue. So I, I will just stop here. If Max is approved, it's great. All right, so uh, I will see you next week. Any questions? I will be here for two more minutes. All right, so if you have no question, then I will just uh, uh, end this class. And I will upload the, uh, the slide, and we will have an assignment uh, where you can already finish the first half of the assignment. We will release the assignment by today. See you next week. Okay, see you. Yeah, if you have any question, feel free to ask. Um, professor, so we're gonna have two written assignments and one more mini project? Yes. Okay. It's very likely that finish this uh, written assignment, you will have a back, back, back to back another written assignment. And then we have a project. And depending on the time, uh, because we have a we have one week gone, right? Because of the uh, uh, the, the we're, we're fed, we're, one day, right? So whether if we don't have time, we'll, we'll skip one one project. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I don't see any questions. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to ask me and ask the TA, including that office hour or by email. Okay. I will upload this video and uh, I will release the written assignment. Thank you and I'll see you next week. Oh, I see a question. So let me type to you. Mahash, uh, what do you want to say? You can unmute yourself and we can discuss here. Oh, you, you mean, w w which concept are you referring to? Yeah, if possible, you can, you can unmute yourself. That would be more efficient.
So the textbook contains all these things we covered. Okay, so let me, let me briefly. So we have a textbook. Right? So if you go to, uh, go to our syllabus, but again, so the textbook is more difficult than what slides. Okay, if you understand everything in the slides, it's good. The textbook has a, uh, let me see. Kind of bonds and these things, right? So, so it's in the textbook. But I, I think uh, as long as you understand our slides and the lecture, things will be much better, okay? Because there's a lot of serum, union bond, etc. Probably you don't want to, so we actually keep it in minimum. Okay? All that you need to understand, we, we put in the slide. So it's an appendix. Another thing that you can look into, I think uh, there's a Yufei Tao, they have some like a chain of bond. I think they have some course material, uh, lecture notes. So this thing is a pretty, pretty common. Okay, so you can read some, uh, some lecture notes there, chain of championship in quality and the chain of bond. Because this is, if you do randomized algorithm, this is basically the first three inequality. Let me, let me put in the chat so that you can get it. Oh, I, I think uh, the student just left. So, okay, so that's pretty much it. And uh, I don't see other questions. Then I will see you guys uh, next time. Okay, I, 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 let me just uh, put in the chat anyway. Okay. Okay, so I, I will leave. Thank you. See you next week.